What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Bro History. It's Henry Zamoda and Danny Abdeljabar. What's up, Danny? How are you? Chilling, man, as per usual. How about yourself? I'm doing pretty well. Um, I don't think I have much banter right now. Yeah, man. It's also kind of late, so <laughs> yeah, it's like, what, 10 have... o'clock at night here? It's super late, 10 o'clock at night. Oh, come on. We, we record at like 2 in the morning, bro. That's what, that's the... Yeah. That's what we're trying to... We uh, never sleep. Present. We, we don't sleep. No. We do this at the crack of dawn to give you guys content. No, it's about 10, 18 p.m. on Thursday the 22nd, I think, right? Or 22nd? Yep, 22. Uh, two days after Hitler's birthday, 420. Um, we, happy 420. Uh, happy 420. <laughs> for the weed um, reason, not for the Hitler reason. Yeah, I, well, I don't smoke weed. Um, I don't celebrate Hitler either. But... <laughs> Um, yeah, it is Thursday, and this will be released on Sunday. Uh, so who knows what we say will be relevant at the time. I mean, we may all be in some type of nuclear holocaust. We might be the, dead. Yeah. We might be dead by the time That's, we release this podcast. So That is a possibility. <laughs> if, if we all died, and if you're listening to this on Sunday, sorry about that. Sorry that this is out of date. But... Um, I want to follow up on our last episode real quick where we spoke about the lead up to the uh, current situation that's going on between R- Russia and Ukraine. Um, Putin just delivered his State of, of the Union address. Yeah, I saw to, that. Or the, uh, mm-hmm. or the federal, uh, the address to the Federal Assembly. And he issued some pretty stern warnings not Putin. to cross the red line. I actually have the, the quote up. I want to read it real quick. Go for it. He said, Russia wants good relations, including, by the way, those with whom we have not been getting along lately. The U.S. Mildly, <laughs> we really do not want to burn bridges. Obviously, he's talking about a combination of Kiev, uh, the United States, and NATO. But here's where it gets interesting. But if someone mistakes our good intentions for indifference or weakness and intends to burn down or even blow up these bridges, they should know that Russia's response will be asymmetrical, swift, and tough. Those behind uh, pro- uh, provocations that threaten the core interests of our security will regret what they have done in a way they have not regretted anything for a long time. At the same time, I just have to make it clear we have enough patience, responsibility, professionalism, self confidence. All right, you get the point. What he said is that if you um, support any type of military response in Ukraine or try to um, bring the Ukraine into NATO or follow uh, Zelensky's uh, political rhetoric of taking back Crimea, then there'll be some type of response by Russia. Yeah, but hold on. Because, like, did he say that explicitly? Because everything he I've didn't been... say that. I... Yeah, because, I, I mean, we're, we're inferring that. But the thing is that I think he that I think he did both a good job and a bad job at is that he was very nondescript about what those red lines were. Like, he didn't make the Obama mistake of saying, hey, if you, uh, if you go under Syria, that's a red line. That's a red line. And then he crossed the red line and we didn't do shit about it. So it made him look like a little bitch. So in one way, he did a good job at not being explicit about what those red lines are. But in another way, it just makes him sound like dumb. Like, you know, what red line do you mean? What are we crossing? You know? Well, that's the mess they got into in 2014. You know? Because they didn't totally follow through with any type of, like, actual military response in the Ukraine. Like, they didn't. Right. Besides putting some special commandos and, and, like, you know, they annexed Crimea, but their military was already there. Right. So they didn't, like, it wasn't a big really invade move, the Ukraine. Right. They just had some special forces in there, like, assisting with the separatists and stuff like that. So it was kind of, you know, not a total military response. However, um, I mean, I think they're just trying to keep their options open. Uh, Putin's a guy who is, uh, I think, intentionally vague at times because he wants to be able to kind of weigh out every single situation. He's very, very uh, Tyrion Lannister-like. Yep, where, very much, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. You know, we when we did that episode— I'm wearing a throne shirt right now, actually, characters. funny enough. Oh. 
uh, we, we did an episode back in the day with world leaders as Game of Thrones characters, and um, Putin was who we assigned Tyrion Lannister to. Tywin. Um, Tywin. Oh, yeah, excuse Tywin me, Tywin Lannister. Lannister, not Tyrion Lannister, the father. Uh, but the U.S., their response, here's something that's interesting. So a week ago, the U.S. intelligence community released their annual briefing on Russia, and what they said was, we assess that Russia does not want a direct conflict with the U.S. forces. Russian officials have long believed that the United States is conducting its own influence campaigns to undermine Russia, weaken Putin, and install Western-friendly regimes in the states of the former Soviet Union and elsewhere. Russia seeks an accommodation with the United States on mutual non-interference in both countries. Domestic affairs and U.S. recognition of Russia's claimed sphere of influence over much of the former Soviet Union. Talk about a candid response. Wow. Yeah. I can't believe how open they were about yeah. that. Yeah. That's, prob- that's actually an assessment of the ground of what's going on. Yep. So, like, but, why, um, why are we drumming up all this, like, you know, saber rattling about it? Then, you know, why, why is it such a problem? If Putin says we're not trying to make a problem and our intelligence agencies say we're not the rush is not trying to make a problem why are we trying to make why are we trying to make a problem <laughs> well i think the i think there's a lot of different um i think there's two primary reasons right now one of the reasons is very partisan the other reason is very is bipartisan mm. the reason that's i think the first reason this is the lesser of the two reasons mm. i think that the partisan reason the democrat the partisan reason is that the democrats hate russia in a don't want to ever give up the the uh, they don't want to get over the 2016 narrative that Russia hacked the election. Okay. So there's like this partisan resentment there from the Democrats. Mm-hmm. But the bipartisan reason is like the real reason, right? Which is that having a threat is a reason to increase your military spending, which is a, a reason, reason to, to increase to money. It's the reason to um, have a bunch of goofy projects like what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, that should be However, pretty interesting. The e- so the EU foreign policy chief, um, he recently came out and said that it would only take one spark to set off a war. So he's kind of leading up a kind of... Uh, um, Gavrilo Princep type situation before World War One, which honestly could be true. It, there probably could be one terrible thing that that goes wrong before a bunch of a chain reaction goes out of control. I think this is like when I said at the end of last episode. I think this conflict right here between uh, Russia and Ukraine um, in Eastern Ukraine right now is probably the most dangerous in the world yeah. as far as just like worldwide um, terrible consequences. Um, the closest conflict that would bring about some type of major, major world war. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't believe that's likely to happen. If there was one conflict to pick, this would be, would that be the conflict. It would be this that one. And, and I'd agree with, with the likelihood being still super slim. Just, you know, using one example of like, in Syria when, you know, we had a couple of conflicts with United U.S. troops and, and Russian troops, kind of like butting heads in the same crowded battle space, you know, and everybody was like, oh, my God, like the fucking Humvees crashed into each other of Russia and, and the United States. We're going to go to war. It's like, no. Yeah, I know. No, we're not. <laughs> Like, like also, both also media clicks as well. Y- yeah, totally. But like, both I parties mean, are are smart enough not to not to do something stupid, and and they're both. I th- I think, it, strangely enough, I kind of agree with what what Putin said. You know, I think you know he said that you know they have a enough to quote him enough patience, responsibility, professionalism, self confidence, and certainty in our in our cause. Like, I think both sides are patient. Both sides are responsible ish. And both sides are definitely professional, and they know that you know little shit is to be ignored. It would take something pretty big, I think, 
to launch well, a Well, here's the thing. You have to have strong talk for the plebs. Right. This mm-hmm. is their mentality. It's like, we need, to, we need to act tough in front of the plebs. Yep. But if shit goes down, we actually have to deal with the consequence. Like, we have to deal with the political unraveling. Right. And people, there is going to be someone to blame. You know, there's going to be a scapegoat. You know, George Bush's legacy was completely destroyed after that. Mm-hmm. After the, I, I mean, didn't really have a legacy to begin with, but his legacy is that of a completely failed president who had neocons hijack his presidency. Right. Now, um, there's obviously a reason to, um, to saber rattle as far as defense spending and things like that, but... No realistic uh, person within the Pentagon or in the Kremlin actually wants to go to war. Everyone knows a war would be devastating. Um, interestingly enough, uh, Douglas McGregor was on Tucker Carlson the other day, and mm-hmm. he was saying how the U.S. does not want to go to war there at all. And he says, "I don't even." He's like, "I don't even think the U.S. could beat a Russia in a conventional war, like let alone nuclear war, in that region of the world on their border." I don't think the U.S. is the favorite in that war. Well, I mean, you know, I have a lot of things and to he's say a about geni- that. That guy's a and that guy is a legit bona fide genius. Yeah, when no, it comes to that type of stuff. To- totally, uh, and th- I think that's that's pretty huge to go on a you know uh, on a conservative network, you know, and you know say to that audience like, hey, not not only do we not want to go to war, but like we probably won't win <laughs> you know uh in a conventional war like that's yeah you gotta have some fucking balls to say that you know well you have to remember what russia's this i promise this is going to lead into the main topic when we when i say this russia's nuclear policy is even if they're if they're ever losing a war so if they're ever losing a conventional war they their uh, nuclear policy is to resort to nuclear weapons right right now I'm sure ours is too, but we've just never lost a yeah. conventional war at, at that scale, you know. I mean, we'll lose, we'll use nuclear war uh, warheads just for like a country nationalizing, like a fucking <laughs> industry resource. Like, yeah. oh, you're nationalizing oil in your country? We're gonna nuke you. <laughs> you're talking about splitting? I mean, uh, um, forming a super Arab state, we're going to nuke Baghdad. <laughs> um, so most policies in the U.S. related to uh, nuclear weapons were actually developed during the very early years of the Cold War. So we're talking about the 1950s and the 60s. And since then, weapons technology has radically changed. So the current policies that we have right now, they still reflect the technical limitations that we had, you know, decades ago. Yep. And nuclear weapons, they're really not about national security anymore. Um, They're not even about world dominance anymore. You know, before it makes like, it, it, nuclear weapons obviously make sense to most people as a de- deterrent. Like someone's not going to attack you because they're at risk of having their entire civilization destroyed. Right. That's the, um, it also makes sense in a Machiavellian re- way as well because if you have nuclear weapons or more nuclear weapons, then you have the ability to push around states that don't have nuclear weapons. Mm-hmm. And if you're up against folks with with nuclear weapons, either the same amount or a comparable amount— then we have that principle of mutually assured destruction where you don't fuck with me, I don't fuck with you because both of us are armed to the teeth with nukes. And that's the standoff that we have right now with Russia. Yeah, well, going back to deterrence. Right. Like most industries, though, within the defense sector, it's more about other factors. It's not even about that. Yep. It's about profiteering, it's about competing budgets between military branches and also about local economic development at the end. I mean, that's mm-hmm. how they persuade states and um, communities and constituents to support these types of policies. Congressional districts, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Which ultimately results in this very weird, outdated policy that is not only expensive, 
but also really puts a lot of us at a potential risk, especially people who are located near a uh, nuclear silo that is meant to launch ballistic missiles at other countries. Um, and the last thing that we want to do is turn into the guy from, you know, you ever see RoboCop? The original one or the new one? The original RoboCop. Yeah, but I was like a kid. I don't really remember. Okay, it. you're not going to get this reference. I was going to say the guy who crashes his truck into like this toxic waste silo. I vaguely and remember he comes that. Out. You, you remember this part? I vaguely, yeah. Oh, and he comes out like, and his skin's melting off. Mm-hmm. And then a car hits him and he just liquefies. Yeah, so. He just liquefies. <laughs> What are you trying to say, that folks that live near a a nuclear silo are going to turn into the RoboCop guy? (laughs) What I'm trying to say is that if you're within the, uh, I mean, if you, if a nuclear bomb drops on you, hopefully it will drop on your head. Hmm. You know, you won't be 30 miles out of, I don't know what the actual blast radiuses are and what the effects are, but. We'll play around with that after the show, actually. Yeah. Hopefully you're not within the radius where it like only melts off your skin and you're still alive. Mm-hmm. Um, but the really what we want to focus on today is our fleet of ICBMs, and I don't maybe you can define what an ICBM is because you're much better at this military tech stuff than I am. Yeah, totally. So ICBM stands for intercontinental. Uh, ballistic missile uh, and um, there's also based intercontinental range ballistic missiles which are like kind of sub versions um, and basically it's a missile uh, it's classified as a missile that has a minimum range of at least 5,500 kilometers which is like 3,400 miles um, many of the, the majority of the intercontinental ballistic missiles that we have right now exceed that by quite a bit um, but basically, it's a, it's a fucking rocket, right? It's a rocket. And they're primarily used for nuclear warheads delivery. Uh, but it could be used for other things, too. Mm, things like space. Like, I, I wasn't kidding when I said it's a rocket. It's literally a rocket ship, right? Like, the same rocket or similar rocket technology that you would see, you know, launching satellites into space. Same thing is an intercontinental ballistics missile. Perfect example of this, you know, we have uh, just a, a limited number of countries have ICBMs. There's Russia, the U.S., China, France, India, the U.K., and North Korea, which brings me to my, my example. North Korea has been developing their ICBM technology over the last forever, um, and, you know, they've been at war with Atlantis testing their fucking rockets and shooting them into the ocean, um, and... Basically, they've been using the guise of saying, oh, no, this isn't intercontinental ballistic missiles. These are for launching, you know, weather satellites, right? Because you could use it for a weather satellite. It's literally the same delivery system, right? Um, And so an intercontinental ballistic missile is basically a device that you can use uh, in, in a nuclear capacity to strike someone from very far away. Uh, And the way that it works is just like a rocket ship, like I've been saying before, it it launches up into space and it travels through the vacuum of space and then falls back down on its target far, like super far away. And that's the way that it works. And and it's been the preferred method uh, of delivering uh, weapons, uh, especially uh, nuclear weapons since the uh, Cold War because of the limitations of the day, right? So when we were in the height of the Cold War, you know, we had... You know, you could you could drop a a nuclear bomb, you know, from a plane, and that's that's the way that it was done. The only two times that it was used in war, you know, uh, uh, Fat Man and and Little Boy, on uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, but the problem with that is that you know planes have limited range; they're super slow. You can shoot them out of the sky, things like that. Um, you could also uh, you know launch them out of a, a, a submarine, right? Uh, but in, at that time, the submarines were kind of like clunky, and it was hard to hard to communicate with them securely. You know, when they're out at sea or underwater, uh, so not a super useful um, 
uh, uh, rapid method of, of delivering weapon systems. And so the the best option during the height of the Cold War was an intercontinental ballistic missile. You know, you, you just have a bunch of silos everywhere, and uh, these things could, you know, hit Russia or pretty much anywhere within a you know five to six thousand mile range in like thirty minutes or so. You know, uh, and you know you could phone it in. You know, the nuclear football travels around with the president everywhere he goes, and. You know, he can plug in his codes and say, go ahead and launch the missiles from pretty much anywhere. Um, well, you heard what happened with Joe Biden, right? <laughs> what? I'm, I haven't heard. What? <laughs> so this, I, I can't believe it really wasn't reported that much. But um, apparently Joe Biden uh, mistook the, the, uh, the football with his life alert. <laughs> <laughs> and he almost, he almost ended up uh, launching. <laughs> a nuclear missile. Well, thankfully, the codes for the for the <laughs> ballistic missile and, and his life alert got are, through all the fail safes. <laughs> his life um, alert is a little bit more easy to use than the the football. I I hope. Um, let, let's actually pull this back a little bit yeah. because um, you actually brought up an article to me prior to us talking about this mm -hmm. from the 2016 debate with Trump. Yeah, sure. When there was a when there was a question about the nuclear triad and Donald Trump clearly doesn't know what it is oh i've, I've got the quotes um, i really want to quote it because it's just okay hilarious. quote it all right so this this guy who was who was um, moderating at the time it's a right-wing radio host hugh hewitt um and he asked the question to trump he says mr trump dr carson just referenced the single most important job of the president the command and control and the care of our nuclear forces and he mentioned the triad the b-52s are older than i am the missiles are old the submarines are aging out. It's an executive order. It's a commander-in-chief decision. What's your priority among nu the nuclear triad? And the answer, holy shit. That's a question that would only ever be asked at a Republican primary debate. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> that would never be asked at a Democratic primary yeah, debate. Yeah, So, So in, in, in one way, it was kind of a gotcha question because, like, you know, you wouldn't see this at a, at a Democratic debate probably, but, but still. Um, that question would just be about, like, um, you know, how do you prioritize like oppressed groups in the LGBTQ or like community? That would be all right. How, that's, like, that's that would be worded that stretch. way. <laughs> like they, like the, what? Um, uh, we're, we're we're getting off topic. The, the the point though is that the question I think is kind of relevant, right? Um, but the answer was stunningly, phenomenally off topic. Uh, by Trump, and I'll, I'll try and read it, but I'm gonna have to skip over a lot of it because a lot of it is just nonsense. Um, so the answer, and I'm not going to do the Trump voice because I'll, I'll lose it after a while. Yeah, nuclear hey, bombs. Hey, okay. hey, you're, you're good. You know, hey, 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 you got hey, us well, well too. Uh, yeah. So he, he says, well, first of all, I think we need somebody absolutely that we can trust who is totally responsible, who really knows what he or she the is best doing. Guys. <laughs> that is so powerful and so important. And one of the things I'm frankly proud of is that in 2003, 2004, I was totally against going to Iraq because you're going to destabilize the Middle East. I called it. I called it very strongly, and it was very important. But we have to be extremely vigilant and extremely careful when it comes to nuclear. Nuclear changes the whole ballgame. Frankly, I would have said, get out of Syria. Get out. If we didn't have the weaponry today, the power is so massive that we can't just leave areas that 50 or 75 years ago we wouldn't care. It was hand-to-hand -hand combat. The biggest problem with the world today is that President Obama, with global warming, which is inconceivable, this is what he's saying. I can't. I'm sorry. I can't. He goes on for like another two or three sentences, and none of it makes any fucking sense. And then he ends it with by saying, that's, in my opinion, the single biggest problem our country faces today. And he just doesn't like mention the nuclear yeah. triad at all you know like he just then goes marco, on this weird ass rant yeah and then marco rubio is like oh, can i he's like raising his hand in the back <laughs> he's like, oh, he's like, can, can i can he wanted he wanted to, he wanted to mansplain to everybody all the viewers know, at home he's what like, the nuclear well triad the nuclear is. triad is <laughs> our ability to launch nuclear warheads in three specific ways it is the three pillars and he's like right, and he's like he's airplanes like, and missiles and submarines and it's like oh cool you get a brownie marco rubio you know what the nuclear triad is honestly but, i feel more comfortable with the guy who doesn't know what it is <laughs> you know what most kind americans do I. don't so know do i kind of i kind of because you know this guy's thinking about it and he has his fucking at this time trump didn't wasn't as ingrained as the, in the MIC as he ended up being right. 
right. as a president. But um, Rubio, of course, is an MIC guy. Yeah, he's a shit. So of course so, he fucking yeah. So like his response a- was just like hard eye roll. It's like yes, you were correct. You know what the nuclear triad is. You think you're scoring points on Trump because he doesn't. He clearly doesn't know what it is. But in actuality, when you look at it, you know the fact that he's. I mean, but I think, nobody, most people don't know what it is. It's not right. something that most people know. Exactly, and it's and, like no shame in not knowing our. Totally, our, and and he makes he makes a mistake in my opinion, right? Because he says at the end of uh, Rubio says at the end of his like mansplaining rant about what the nuclear triad is, he says all three, and he's in, in this case he's talking about the the legs of the nuclear triad. He says all three are critically important, and. That's when I realized, especially after doing this, this you know, the research for this episode, that he was totally wrong, right? They're not critically important. All three of them aren't critically important. That's how I know that that was the answer that would come from an MIC shill, right? Like, let's call a spade a spade. Well, let's let's actually pull this back a little bit because I think it's I think it's important to um, kind of go give like a brief history sure. of what these three. Um, pillars are yep. because when we first started dropping nukes, well, you know, the first two nukes and only nukes that we dropped, um, the only way to drop these or deliver these warheads was by, by plane, by an airplane. Mm-hmm. So such as the ones dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right? They were dropped by planes mm-hmm. or um, the problems with using bombers is pretty self-evident. So um, you have to spend time flying to the target to drop the bomb, right? And you often like, have to stop and run. refuel a bunch of times if you're going across the world, right? Well, the more obvious one as well is that the plane can be shot down, right? <laughs> yeah, at any point, for going at from where point, it started to where it's down. going, it could get shot down. And plus, it's super limited in range. I mean, nowadays we have the ability to refuel in midair, but even that has its limitations. And so you got to really think about like how far can you go on a tank of gas, and then you also have to come back. You know what I mean? So you have to factor like the return flight in on your calculations on how far out you can go. So that means when you fly one of these sorties to like put a nuclear weapon down on a on someone, you you have to like cut whatever the range of the airplane is in half because you have to turn around you know well what the end the u.s did to put a to you know mitigate this is that they always had bombers up yep so there was always a bomber in the air with nuclear warheads in the case that there was attack on if, if there was a you know a russian attack on america or more likely a russian attack on a u.s base then there would be a bomber in the air at all times that would go and um, They'd be like gassed you know, up and ready to go, right? Yeah, they would be in the air and then they would fly to the predetermined target and then they would drop their bombs. Mm-hmm. But at, around the same time, though, in the fi- it was in the fifties and the fifth in the fifties, they started developing, um, you know, the ICBMs and then, you know, the nuclear warheads that they brought that they could have on the field. Um, both the Soviets and the, and the U.S. I believe they they made them around the same time. I'm not really sure who came. I, I think. I mean, I'm not an expert on this. I think the U.S. came up with them first, but I think they were on the field around the same time. What ICBMs? ICBMs. Do you know that? If who? So who... that's that's a tri- that's a tricky story because, like I said, uh, intercontinental ballistic missiles uh, are are basically just like we stole the idea from the Germans. Yeah, know, like this, the, like the V two rockets. You know, so it's kind of hard to. It, it really just depends on where we want to, what we want to consider as the first ICBM, because technically the Germans have had them for a long time. So, you know, the, the V2s. But as far as like nuclear delivery systems, I don't know. Hard to tell. I mean, regardless, they, they, they had these around the same time. Yeah. Um, it's almost irrelevant go- because like we, yeah, we both ended around. up having it. Yeah. And I mean, I guess with this now, it only takes thirty minutes to hit a target, and these and these missiles can travel about what six thousand miles or more. Oh yeah, yeah. And actually, I got some conflicting like evidence for like how far they can go. Uh, so the, for the ones that we were using, so there's there's this uh, Minuteman threes that we're using the the LGM thirties Minuteman threes. They're cheap-ish, I want to say, and trust me, they ain't cheap. They're seven million a pop. 
but like relative to some of the other things that I'd like to talk about, it's relatively cheap. They fly Mach 23, so fucking fast. That's hypersonic, and I want to talk about that later. Um, and they can go anywhere between 6,000 and 13,000 mile range. I got a lot of conflicting data on this particular point, and we have 530 in service. So, well, let's let's talk about the submarines because the submarines, mm-hmm. I think, are what kind of. Um... Well, let's let's save the subs for last. Let's let's talk about the bombers instead. So let's wrap okay. up the ICBMs, talk about the bombers, and let's do subs first. So last couple bits on ICBM. So uh, ICBMs technically can be launched on land, in silos, on trucks, or in in a submarine. Um, but the most famous ones that were that were uh, that are in our nuclear triad are the silo-based intercontinental ballistic missiles. And you know, like I said, the, the Miniman three is is the one that everyone thinks about because that's the one that are currently in service and that we have like over 500 of them in service. The other one, uh, just just talking about planes for a bit, uh, and I'll nerd out for a bit uh, here. There's there's a bunch of different bombers uh, that we use, and these are strategic long range bombers. Um, and uh, the oldest ones, um, well, the oldest one is the is the uh, the B fifty two Stratofortress, right? It's old as dirt, but it's super reliable. We're talking about nineteen fifties tech. The range is pretty long, though, uh, at like eight point eight thousand miles, right? So it it can go pretty far. But again, you have to remember it has to go in one direction and then turn around and come back the other way. So really, the effective range would be about half half of that distance, right? So four thousand miles. It's still pretty fucking long, though, right? Um, but it's also uh, slow as hell. It's like Mach 0.8, so sub supersonic, 650 miles an hour. So you do the math, 650 miles an hour. It's going to take hours and hours and hours to get, you know, a, f- a full 4,000 miles. So it, it seems like planes are irrelevant then when it comes kind to of, nuclear warfare. But you know what? They're they're super. They're they're useful because you can put a lot of bombs in them. So in in this case, the B2 Strata Fortress can hold up to 70,000 pounds of bombs. That's, so what, we're carpet bombing? <laughs> you could bomb the shit out of people. With nuclear bombs? <laughs> you could. Don't, isn't the point of to. a nuclear bomb is you only need, like, one? Well, so it depends on the nuclear bomb because they all have different blast like yields. But the point, though, but is that you can... all the ba- blast yields of these things, like... Like, the smallest nukes, like the first nukes that came out, you, you know, if you drop... If you dropped them in Manhattan, it, it would basically take out pretty much all of central Manhattan, right? All right. Well, p- proposition, right? Uh, Pre-ICBMs, we only had planes, right? And we had subs, but nothing that was able to launch like an ICBM or anything like that. So you've got a plane. Do you want to just put one bomb in there or do you want to stock it full of as many fucking bombs as you can, including both nuclear and conventional? So like this thing is is lit- it's called a stratofortress strato fortress for a reason. It's it's literally a fortress. I mean, seventy thousand pounds of payload is like a hundred and forty five hundred pound bombs, right? And it can also carry some pretty heavy bombs, like large giant yield bombs. Um, so you know, like I said, there are different classifications and different um, yields of nuclear warheads, and this thing can carry the biggest ones, the absolute largest, biggest ones. Um, then uh, after that, you know, the B1 Lancer came around. That was like 70s, 80s tech. So it's, it's still pretty old, but actually they're still in service, believe it or not. Uh, it's supersonic, uh, but barely. Uh, Mach 1.25 for some variants and only at high altitude. Um, but at least it can, it can move faster than the other one. It has reasonable range at uh, 8,000 miles on a single tank. Um, payload is less than the Super Fortress. I think probably they, they made up for it with the speed, but something like 24 to 40 bombs uh, or missiles, depending on the variant. Um, and But it can also hold up to 5,000 pound bombs, right? So that that's kind of the, the big boy bombs, like the big boy uh, um, nukes are going to be in that in that size. Uh, these guys are about $200 million uh, per unit, which as far as like the rest of these planes I'm about to talk about is, is pretty affordable. And, and we've been using them pretty reliably for a while. But it was the B-2 Strata Fortress that, that that um, Hugh Hewitt was saying is older than him. And it's true, and it's kind of surprising that we still use them. Um, now, later on, we start getting some pretty cool tech, and that's the B-2 Spirit. So this is a fifth-generation airframe with just shit ton of technology. Uh, it is from, like, the 80s and early 90s. 
uh, stealth capable, right? So we're talking about like a fixed wing, like that's the bat wing looking one. You know, if you don't know what it looks like, it's they're dope. Uh, so it's, it's it's a fixed delta wing, and and it's just stealth on and all black and super cool looking. And just stealth means that the plane goes invisible, like Wonder Woman, right? No, no it doesn't. <laughs> stealth means that it is nearly invisible for radar. So what that means is when uh, there's a thing called a, a radar cross section, and that is how large an object shows up on a radar a radar screen. And so by using clever technology, stealth technology, you can trick a radar into thinking that something that's the size of a fucking plane, a bomber, is maybe the size of a couch, you know? And because it's so damn small, nobody really knows, what the fuck is that? Is that an enemy threat? Is that just a bird? What is it, you know? Um, So they they kind of fly under the radar, so to speak. Um, But they have a lower range at less than 7,000 kilometers, but they can do mid-air refueling, so that can bring it up to 10,000 miles. That's also tricky and and dangerous in general. Um, And these things are fucking expensive, $737 million per unit. But the total cost of them, when you include spare parts and maintenance and all this other stuff, can be up to $2 billion a pop. Very, very (laughs) expensive plane. Um, and uh, good payload, like probably about 80 or so uh, uh, like GPS-guided bombs or 16 fairly large 2,400-pound bombs, um, but also pretty slow, like sub-supersonic, so Mach 0.09. Um, Man, that's more, that's like three, four, like five times more expensive than what F-35s are going for now. Yeah, yeah. F-35s I mean, but- are like... 120 a pop but at least these things stay in the air so <laughs> yeah i guess yeah. so <laughs> um but yeah i mean they're they're very expensive but they're not meant for us to buy a lot of units of these like the the, the point for these is like they're, to buy buy a handful and use them in str- their strategic bombers you know like this is not like our, our defense fleet or anything like that you know um and then uh not out yet but we're um uh, northrop grumman same guys who made the b2 spirit are building the B-21 Raider. Uh, it's not out yet, so I don't really have very much to say about it, but from what I've learned, uh, Northrop got the contract in 2015. It should be out in a couple of years, so like sometime around 2026. Probably not, though, because let's be honest, they never stay on schedule. Um, they'll probably blame the coronavirus or some shit like that. Um, and uh, it's definitely going to be a stealth wing, just like the B-2, but... Uh, the payload, the the range, are obviously unclear because it's not out yet. But it'll probably be comparable to the B two Spirit. Maybe you know get some some bumps up from that. Uh, I honestly think that as much as I love planes, this is probably going to be an underwhelming plane. I bet it'll have a shit ton of technology in it, like the F thirty five. I bet it's going to be extremely expensive, uh, and I bet that it'll be able to put. A, like a massive amount of ordnance down, but like it'll just be kind of like a dumb idea, you know, for for reasons that we'll go over in a minute. But uh, I found this quote. It says that the Air Force's initial plans were to acquire eighty to a hundred LRSB aircraft. So this is the the um, the classification of aircraft that this is, um, at a cost of five hundred million per unit. And I just lulled super hard at that because like they're not going to get them at five hundred million, five hundred fifty million a unit. Like, there's not. The B-2 Spirit is $737 million per unit by itself. Like, with uh, everything, all in, with everything together, it's like $2 billion a, $2 billion a pop. There's no way that they're getting this at $550 million. Oh, yeah, there's no way. And especially <laughs> if it's coming out in 2006. 2026. 2026. Yeah, not even, there's no fucking way. <laughs> or, I mean, the plan relaunches 2026. There's no, there's absolutely no way. It'll probably close that it'll be a billion dollars a unit. Minimum. Um, minimum. M- minimum. But Jesus Christ. All right. So the point of this episode, and I just kind of want to re- redirect where we're going with this. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're talking about how um, a lot of the uh, our nuclear defense industry is also ingrained in this like MIC welfare state. Mm-hmm. And ICBMs are a really big culprit. And ICBMs are 
here's my opinion on this, and and you can just take it from here because sure. you know more about this stuff than I do. Um, ICBMs were basically made defunct by by nuclear submarines, weren't they? Basically, basically, and and. Do you want to continue with that, or should I? No, I'm this. I'm, I'm, I'm. You, you go on and take this from here because I, you know, I don't really know yeah, too much for, about nuclear subs or, or anything yeah, like that. I just sure. know that when they first, I here's what I know about them. So when they first came out in like the 50s and 60s, or when they, when nukes, when submarines started carrying nukes, um, the the disadvantage was that they. Um, I guess at the time the submarines didn't know where they were exactly, so they didn't know um, you know how far they were from their potential targets. But then once like you know the submarine technology increased, then they were they were more effective and much better because they're not you're not able to locate them. Like they're right. ba- they're basically impenetrable underwater. You can't find them. Like. You yeah, can't. Or good luck finding them, really. Good, yeah, you know. good luck finding them. If you just want to go to war with Atlantis, like Kim Jong Il, <laughs> yeah, Hill, yeah Kim, exactly, Kim Jong Un, um, they'd, they'd have then, an enemy would have a lot of ground to cover to find these. So, so, so the, the idea for putting nukes in submarines and using those as la- launch vessels for submarines is is not new in particular. Like it, it was always the idea to do it. Um, because as you said, it provides natural cover. It's under the fucking water, right? Uh, and you can swim that fucker over wherever you want. And, you know, you you could get closer to your targets. So the actual weapons that they deliver don't have to have ridiculous ranges like the intercontinental ballistic missiles do. Remember, intercontinental ballistic missiles are kind of expensive and kind of clunky because it's literally a rocket. It's literally a rocket ship. And, you know, you shoot it off into space and it's everyone can see what you've done because everyone's got satellites nowadays. Yeah, it'll only take 30 minutes to get to its target. But, you know, to be honest, there are warning systems that will be available. They're going to try and shoot it out the sky, you know, and they can also they're always watching the place where we have the missile silos. And strangely enough, and we'll talk about nuclear sponges in, in general in a second, but strangely enough, everybody knows where these are. Like you can Google it. And you can find out exactly where where is the nearest like nuclear sponge, you know, uh, uh, where's the nearest nuclear missile silo for you. And spoiler alert: if you live on the coast, you probably don't have one near you. But if you're in the mid upper Midwest, you're you've probably got one in your backyard. Um, you're probably if you live in Colorado, Wyoming, um, I think South, South Dakota, Dakota, North, North Dakota, Dakota, Utah, mm-hmm. the upper Midwest, uh, the those areas, and you know they bring obviously it sounds crazy on surface like hey like do you want to live near a place that would is uh, it's there to be the target i don't of think a most, nuclear strike i don't know I, I don't know a ton of people from the midwest but i'd imagine that most people don't even think about it they don't know i wouldn't about think about that, it if someone yeah. told me this there was one in new york i mean there would i mean the whole purpose of having a sponge is to spare new york city Right. Talk about the coastal well, elites here. sacrificing <laughs> Jackson, yeah. Wyoming. You know that's yeah. that's the whole that's the whole that's, point of having that's the it. Bit, is right. to you have should be super pissed off about less that populated areas. areas. Your yeah. less populated areas take the blunt of the nuclear force. But you know we'll, we'll, the, we'll get the there crux. in a second. Okay, yeah. so, so we'll get there in a second. So back to subs. The point though is that at the time around the fifties, like it was hard to communicate with subs, especially in in a in a manner that was secure right and consistent so you know that really wasn't a viable option so they built all of these icbms but really once our sub technology just caught up and we made them nuclear you know it it is just unfathomable that we don't invest more money into subs and so we have three main types of subs right now there are attack subs which are armed to the teeth and they're primarily used for ship to ship combat so including other subs smaller warships and even commercial freighters like we'll blow up anything with those guys these these are the types of subs that aggressively hunt in the oceans you can think of them like kind of sharks you know uh then we also have cruise missile subs um and cruise missile subs are kind of are partly meant for ship to ship warfare uh, but specifically against larger military vessels, things like carriers and destroyers and stuff. Um, but as the name implies, they carry cruise missiles, 
so those have sea to sea and sea to land capabilities. So you can use a cruise missile sub to attack a target in the water or attack a target on land. I'm not certain if they can attack targets in the air or not. I'm supposed if they were properly outfitted, they could, but let's just assume for, for, for lack of information that they don't really attack the sky. Um, but then we have the, uh, the third type, which is a ballistic missile sub. And this is the type of sub that really just makes ICBMs totally obsolete. Now, the particular type of submarine that, that we want to talk about for ballistic missile subs are the Ohio-class subs. And the Ohio-class subs are nuclear-powered submarines. We have 14 of them that are ballistic missile submarines and four of them which are cruise missile submarines. Each of them displace a lot. They're, this, they're, the, they're probably the largest submarines ever built for the U.S. Navy, but I think they're the third largest submarines in general. The Russians have two types of submarines that are bigger, um, but ours are way, way better. Uh, they're about $2 billion a pop, so keep that number in mind, right? It costs about as much as a fully loaded uh, B-2 bomber. However, you know, they've been in commission since the early 80s, so they're a bit older than the B-2 bombers, but they're nuclear-powered, which means that their range, and I was looking up the specs on this, it literally said it limited only by food supplies, which is just hilarious, right? Like, they could go on and on and on forever, basically, the only time they for ever someone have to stop who, is for to someone get food. Who, who might be confused by a nuclear sub and mm -hmm. a nu a sub that's holding nuclear warheads and a, and and a nuclear, nuclear powered, powered sub. right Just, right that's can a good you explain that's a good, what it, what it is real quick yeah thank you that, that's difference. a good distinction a nuclear powered sub means that the propulsion systems like how the how the thing moves is powered by a nuclear reactor which sounds insane but it's a thing. Pretty much all of our uh, all of our uh, largest warships and and all of our submarines for sure are nuclear powered, and that means that the energy that is used to propel the ships and move them and you know uh, power the ships like guidance systems and all that other stuff are all electric and they're all powered by this like little mini, hopefully not a Chernobyl, <laughs> you know, um, and so. The cool thing so there's about not that like is, some dirty guy in the back with like a shovel with his shirt off pouring coal into yeah no and it's not like a decent so more commonly you know we we haven't used coal fired anything for I know a while. I'm just saying no. <laughs> that's kind of like the image you get when powering a ship at like some <laughs> yes, British that's guy. not happening no no um, but uh, m more commonly like a lot of countries use diesel powered um, ships so you, you have a uh, a generator that's powered by diesel. And they're usually pretty powerful, right? And they'll they'll turn the propulsion systems, but they also make create electricity, which you know uh, powers the ship. But the thing about those is that you know it's it's fu it's fucking gas, right? So like, and the gas mileage on them probably sucks too. So uh, yeah, imagine um, fucking gas mileages on a submarine. what's the gas what's the gas mileage on a on a Russian submarine? I don't know. What's the uh, gas mileage on like a fishing boat, dude? I don't know. It's don't know awful, yet. man. That's like everyone who has a boat. Everyone, I think every guy goes through like a bit of like a little fantasy. He's like, I want to save up for a boat. I'm gonna buy <laughs> like, a you know what I mean? Like until you I find really, out how much gas. I costs. really, I really would want a boat. And you're like, maybe you like look online and be like, oh, how much is a boat? Oh, it's, it's only forty grand for this boat. Maybe I can get it. You know, I'll have enough disposable income to get a boat. I'll be a guy with a boat. And then you'll speak to somebody who has a boat, and they'll be like. Oh, man, I spent fucking twenty thousand dollars in gas this year. I'm like, all right, I'm not getting a boat. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, like, so, so going back to that, you know, if it, nuclear power enables you to go on pretty much forever, right? I think the operating lifespan is like eighty years or something like that before you have to change out the fuel, which is basically forever, right? We'll never, we'll probably never use a ship for that long. Um, so it's only limited by the food, right? So as opposed to the airplanes, right, which have to stop for, for gas every now and again, this thing can just go on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever and ever. And it moves around, so it's not a static target like an ICBM, right? It's not sitting in, in Minot Air Force Base, you know? Uh, uh, it's just, it moves around and it's hidden and you don't know where it is. And the difference, as you asked, between a nuclear-powered sub and a submarine that has nuclear weapons is just that, right? 
the first when we say a nuclear powered sub when we say a nuclear sub we mean a nuclear powered sub it just happens to have some weapons on it that are nuclear capable um so where was i on on ohio double nuclear subs. that's the term they should double use. nuclear yeah double nuclear nuclear so, powered and nuclear warheads all right so um ohio class subs the last bit i'll say on this is that their payload is pretty awesome uh, so the newest variants will carry 24 Trident twos. These are um, uh, uh, ballistic missiles, uh, and I'll talk about those in a second. Uh, and up to half of them could be nuclear tipped. So we're talking about 12 nuclear weapons on one submarine. You know, you could potentially put more, way more than that, in a B2 bomber, but they're slow. They're loud. You can shoot them out of the sky. They have to stop for refueling. You know, there's a whole sleuth of problems. And it's still better than ICBMs because, well, I'll talk more about that in a second. So uh, one thing that's super interesting about this that's kind of a tragedy is that the Ohio-class submarines are expected to be retired by 2029. That's only eight years from now. So, so we what have, is the what is going have, to be the successor of the Ohio class subs? So that part's not clear, and I'm sure that there are a bunch of you know like military contractors like salivating to get their hands on a contract to to be the next you know nuclear uh, submarine producers, but we're expected to 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 change them out. I mean, there's no way that the United States uh, Navy is going to not have like ballistic missile subs. We're definitely going to have them, but I just don't know what they're going to be. There's not a whole lot of information on that yet. See, like, subs is, is like the... I think you could really defend the U.S. with just... With a submarine fleet. Well, you know, well that's like, what Ron Paul thinks. Ron Paul said, what, like, I mean, let's that's pull... that's what I... All of my opinions come from Ron Paul. <laughs> from so. Ron Paul. Yeah, Ron Paul was so like, yeah, let's surprising. pull out of every single base in the world and let's, like, stop investing in, in ridiculous military shit. But you know what? Those... He was like, submarines are cool. We can we can build more submarines. <laughs> And, and I, I agree with them. I mean, it's smart because, again, I, I, I can't underscore this enough. It's it's a moving target. You can't find it. It's underwater. It, you can arm it to the teeth with 12, up to 12 nuclear missiles. Uh, and you can get closer to your targets because you just swim up to them. So, you know, your range is extended by quite a bit, you know, as opposed to a uh, intercontinental ballistic missile that's launched from the middle of the United States, like you have a, an operating range, right? It, it can only go so far unless you make a better missile. Um, so I really like the idea of this as, as far as a deterrent. And the Trident II's that they are launching, these are pretty interesting too. They're, they're submarine launched missiles. They're built by Lockheed Martin Space. Uh, they first deployed them in 1990 and they're still in service. These things are expensive. Remember how I said $7 million was reasonably cheap for a intercontinental ballistic missile, the Minuteman 3s? You want to know how much these things cost? Um, I don't know, probably around like what, like $25, 30000000 million? $30.9 million each. Each. But I mean, what's, you know, what's $30 million for protecting the nation, right? <laughs> Um, anyway, the range is classified on these technically, but uh, I think the the best approximations are like seven. The thing is, though, is that when you when I hear thirty million dollars, like thirty point nine million, it sounds like chump change compared to a lot of the other expenditures that we we have in the military. Of course, of course, you but know what I mean. Like when you like, compare it with we're a, talking about aircraft. a single we're we're talking about a single use item, right? It's one thing to say, uh, you know, the F thirty five is you know. 140 million dollars a piece right and that sounds like a lot of fucking money and it is but the thing is that you can reuse an airplane yeah. you know like you can keep using it um as opposed to a missile you fire it off once it's gone that's it kind of like the tomahawk missiles are like 150k and we drop like 64 of them in syria one day just because you know uh and that's that's a shit ton of money like that's a lot of money and they expire right so we're on the trident twos because you know the the Trident ones are out of date, in the same way that we're in we're at Minuteman threes because the Minuteman one and the Minuteman twos we didn't use them all. They just went out of date. They ex like they have an expiration date, you know, and and they need to be upgraded every now and again. So that's why we're at that. So the fact Do that we you have know how long the expiration date is 
or do you have an idea or did you say it or did uh, I just miss it? I didn't say it specifically and unfortunately I did close out my my Minuteman map where it was showing like when each of the Minuteman iterations had came out but I want to say that uh, well first of all we never wait until the expiration date to, <laughs> to change the missiles that's a stupid idea right so we always like you know refresh them early because that would be a really bad idea if we waited too long and they turned out to be duds um but but I want to say like every 20 or so years it seems like we are cha- updating the missile. So basically what we're saying is 30 million dollars a pop, one one nuclear sub can carry up to 12 of these that are nuclear powered, right? Or 24 uh that are conventional. So let's do some math, right? So 30 million, so let's say 30 times 24 per sub is 720 million. So 720 times how many do we have? 14 subs is it's a billion. It's a billion dollars every. No, excuse me. It's 10 billion dollars. It's 10 billion dollars that we're gonna either use and then that's it. They're gone or not use and we're just gonna end up scrapping them and replacing them in like 10 to 20 years. So it's kind of a money suck. It's kind of a money pit. A little bit. Yeah. Um it it it's a prime money pit. It's um, it's a lot of money. It's not it's not a small amount of money. And this is just for like one thing, you know, like there's the, the military does has like probably 500 of these things that, you know, have expiration dates and cost millions of dollars each and, you know, either we use them or we lose them kind of deal, you know what I mean? So It's better use them. No, <laughs> that's not a good idea. Um, all right, so this thing, the 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 Trident twos, the, the range. That's the mentality that I was like, man, we yeah, bought right. this we thing. Might as well, might might as well go to work, right? Um, I mean, right, come no. on, who's bad? <laughs> Just anyone who's bad in this world. Come on, come on. Right. Isn't there some new? jihad group uh come on why don't we just make one up then <laughs> you can totally if you think in that way yeah if you just think like a business like just think like you're you're um you know trying to raise the shares of lockheed martin or just just think about it in like in this machiavellian sense of in this machiavellian view you're like man we really need to sell these missiles they cost so much to make and create Man, we just, we need to find someone to use them on. There's no one else to use them on. That's the problem. We're There's gonna no expire. market, man. <laughs> isn't there a way? Isn't there a way to like make? Come on, isn't there some like group in uh, you know the African world or the or the East? Uh, one of those jihad groups. Come on, think of one. Come on, come on. Let's let's brainstorm. Let's think of one of these jihad groups. Come on. Uh, what is that? Boko Haram. The Boko Haram. They sound kind of cr- mean. Let's uh. <laughs> Jesus, and that's that's just the it, you joke, but that's kind of what goes on in the MIC right now. Well, Wait, one, which one's one, the, which one's the good guy in Yemen? Is it the Houthis or is it the other one they're fighting? <laughs> the other one they're fighting is Al Qaeda. Hmm, this is a tough decision. We could probably get away with bombing them both. <laughs> Good plan. We used twice <laughs> twice the number of bombs. No, oh, the government wants to, the government over there declared war on one of those. Oh, so they want to buy us? Oh, this perfect, perfect, <laughs> perfect situation. So we we actually had a guest on a while ago. His name is Christian Sorensen, former Air Force. Wrote a really awesome book called Understanding the War Industry, and I definitely recommend it for anyone who's interested in these topics because, you know, we're, we're joking here about how someone in Lockheed or in military industrial complex generally speaking might why they would about, fund a think tank or fund the publication or right. plant the seed money for a group like pnac that right. would put out these ideas because Exa- exactly you know obviously lockheed martin is a technical if they're private companies technically right they're not they're not they're not government they're, yeah, not, they're not selling the anything that we can buy <laughs> they're not go- yeah. you don't elect the C- the people don't elect the ceo of lockheed martin no, you but we also don't. No we, we don't buy shit from Lockheed. Like yeah. you and I, I can't buy a single thing from Lockheed. Yeah, we Martin. don't buy things from Lockheed Martin. But no, they're not part of the government. However, however, how there's a big however. Um, there's this revolving door, whereby military people will do a stint in the military, and then when they retire from the military, they're high up enough where they've made 
you know, connections and they've got rapport and stuff like that. And so they'll immediately take a cushy job with Raytheon or Lockheed or Boeing or any name any of these companies that, that build defense contracts. And then they will lobby the military to get those products sold or, or win contracts, etc. And then they'll also loop in the congressional bit of it, right, where Congress people or, or sometimes executives at these military, uh, uh, um, uh, these contractors will become or influence, more likely influence, members of Congress so that they can pass laws that are friendly uh, towards the, you know, the, the war industry or friendly towards war in general because that passively, uh, you know, helps out the war industry. And it even gets so fucked up that even ending wars can be profitable for the contractors in the war industry because they set up all these, like, clean up after the war services that are incredibly expensive and ridiculous in and of itself. Awesome, awesome book, Understanding the War Industry by by Kristen Sorensen. Or you can take a listen to our episode that we uh, did with him. That was in, I feel like that was in November or something like that of last year. Yeah, Christian's, Christian's a great guy, so definitely support him by getting his book. Yeah. Um, um, and he's really smart, so listen to the episode. Now, he, another thing is that, you know, these... Lockheed Martin, you know, they will fund, like, they'll they'll plant the seed money. They planted the seed money for a uh, project of a new American century. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the, you know, the, the, the think tank that came out with a lot of the false information about Saddam Hussein having, <laughs> uh, you know, nuclear weapons. nuclear weapons underneath his palace and mm-hmm. all sorts of just crazy, crazy conspiracy theories that we went to war over. Mm-hmm. Um, like, they, I mean, they will fund that stuff so they're kind they they have such a major role in influencing policy but it's not just that i want to get back to to the, the sponge the con the, to the sponge yeah. because i think this is the main thing that we're trying to tackle today and i think it's it's valuable to have the context of our nuclear capability and the united states nuclear policy but what what a nuclear sponge is is a it's it, it sounds like kind of like a technical thing right like it sounds like a nuclear sponge would be part of a of a of a missile or something or or like a, devi- that, a, a device that like crew. cleans up you know nuclear waste after a yeah um, that's what it sounds yeah, like it sounds but like. a nuclear a nuclear sponge is a um you, it's supposed to be like a magnet for not other, a physical magnet it's a it's like a it's a strategy really is what it is with this it's a strategy where you're putting a uh, silo somewhere where where it's less populated than you know, let's say uh, Los Angeles or Manhattan or Washington D.C. And the point is, is that when your enemy, when your adversary attacks you in a nuclear war, they send their bombs to your to your targets to your missile silos. To your missile silos, and why do they do that? Because because they they see every missile that you have as a threat. If Russia decided to hit us with a nuke, and let's say they did target you know San Francisco or something like that, they could hit San Francisco. But the moment that they did that, we're going to launch all hell at them. So from all of our missile silos, right? Like we're just going to go ape shit. So they're not going to stop at just hitting the target that they intended. They're also going to want to hit every nuclear missile facility that they know about that we have, which, again, is kind of wild that you can literally Google for this. Like, you can find them. It's super easy. It's it's not like a secret. So it doesn't take the most sophisticated intelligence unit to figure out where our uh, no it's it's absolutely not a secret you can find out heartland you can find out it's so easy just google it they're they're all there there's like pictures and maps and stuff like that you can see it you can see from google earth you can see the fucking silos i wish they'd put one of those next to washington (laughs) dc why i'm joking (laughs) but not really but like you know if we were going to sacrifice a city so here's the thing: the, the sponge <laughs> like if we were going to sacrifice the, the sponge. If we were going to sacrifice a city. I'm just saying, Washington, Washington D.C. Would probably be should be the, the city that we sacrifice. 
I don't know. I'm, um, I'm not really. Doing I'm not it. saying I would sacrifice a city. I'm just saying that would be the city to sacrifice. Um. But no, I have family who lives there. I would never, obviously, want that. I'd probably go for like Atlantic City, because like it's Atlantic a, it, City. Yeah, because you know it's it's kind of a sad place, or like Niagara Falls. <laughs> but you're from Jersey. Yeah, but you know it's it's just Ni- it's Niagara just kind of, Falls. Yeah, those are those you, are just kind of what the New York the side, New York you know? the New York side of that is pretty gross. It's it's sad. It's pretty ratchet up in Western New York. It's kind of sad, dude. But Western New York, once you you realize why Bills fans are the way they are once you travel to Western New York. <laughs> it's windy, it's cold, and there is nothing of like scenic beauty at all. Like you don't even really get a good view of Niagara Falls. That's on the Canadian side of the border. Uh it's uh it's almost as sad as northern Indiana. I, I know northern, nothing about North I don't think I've ever been in northern Indiana. I can't speak to that. Indi Indi northern Indiana near like Chicago is not beautiful. Well I'll I'll have to not go there. <laughs> <laughs> naming, naming parts of the um, anyway, uh, back to the sponge. That, so the, the, put, the nuclear the sponge is, is, that. is is again the nuclear sponge is again a strategy, and the strategy is put your missile silos out in the open so that your enemy decides to attack those places instead of the populated places, which is a crazy prospect. And and that's the that's the military strategy. But as I think you're probably going to point out here, Henry, there's also there's also like non military, you know non-military ideas that 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 so support this. The real the real interesting thing about these sponges is that they the, the strategic military value of course is to, you know, attract missiles mm-hmm. in the case of a war. But obviously there's a, an entire, you know, industry surrounding this. So, um the local economies, um the politicians of these regions, they support these things being there. And the reason why is because they bring jobs. They're big employers to these to these areas. Mm-hmm. And you know, like how the war industry and how you know the, the military industrial complex works. It, you know, it works on so many different levels. You know, it works politicians, but it also works local governments, and also works um, it, it works state governments because a state a state government is never going to say. Uh, dismiss a project or dismiss a company that potentially will bring wages and bring jobs to a specific area yeah but you know what Uh, it's it and this is again um partly myth because you know when when they do all the 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 work to figure out how many jobs do military contracts and and as an example icbms uh in in 1993 you know, the Pentagon was saying that that we should remove ICBMs from the nuclear triad uh, when they were doing their nuclear posture review. So literally, Pentagon saying like, "Hey, we don't need these anymore. We should probably like pull the plug on this." But but that was actually attacked, you know, uh, by uh, elements in the Air Force along with. 